Give them time to transition back everything in order. Well, um, today we're going to ask a very interesting question. Is church essential? Is it essential? Um, you saw three different videos and three different perspectives when it comes to is church essential? And I'm going to tell you, um, this is a battle right now in our world because some pastors are saying, why you got the bowling alley open, the nail salon open, but you don't have the church open? And many governors are saying, because we think that the church is not essential. They don't know what to do with the church. And it's not that they just thought about the church being not essential. It's always been not essential. People just don't get, why do we have to gather together and sing to God and hold hands and encourage each other and love on each other and, and, and listen to the fairy tales that Pastor Tez preaches about? There's some governors that have actually said, we don't see the church opening for a year. Specifically in California, um, most of those have said that churches are a part of phase three of that governor's plan. And phase three of that governor's plan is almost 18 months from now. Now, I don't want you to be foolish. There are some foolish folks that have said, let's get out of teens and let's go to the Capitol. And let's stand for Jesus. Let me tell you something. That is not Jesus. When you see folks saying, we're standing up for our rights and bringing guns into the Capitol just so they can tell folks how essential church is. You know how you can tell folk how essential church is? You pray for your governors. You pray for your folks. You show the love of Jesus. They'll see the power of God in the church. You see, I don't think it's about, you know, you know unfortunately, there's a side of Christianity that will call those people and say they're communist liberals and they don't want us to meet because they're trying to step on our rights. I don't believe that's it. I think what it really is, is, is remember the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 8 that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. People that don't know Jesus naturally don't know what to do with church. They naturally don't know what to do with the cross. Why? Because the Bible says it's foolishness to those who are perishing. It ain't time to get your M16 and go and stand and say, we're going to protest for the right of freedom of religion. No. What it's time is, is you need to show the power of God through the church. Because really they don't get it. They don't get it because Jesus said, and, and the scriptures say, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But they're asking the question, is church really even necessary? Is it essential? There are some people that have said, you know the reason why the church is not essential to me? The reason why the church is not essential to me is because y'all pastors make too much money. <laughs> Really, the church is supposed to be feeding the hungry. The church is supposed to be helping those that are sick. The church is supposed to be helping uh, people. And I love what Bishop Jake said. If we gave away all of the church's money and didn't pay nobody, we still wouldn't come close to feeding everybody. But yet the government says, I'm going to take my 40%. And you don't have the right or the obligation to try to help folks that are in need. Please, what are they saying? They're saying the church really isn't that essential. They're saying the church really isn't that essential. That's what they're really saying. And then they say, yo, pastor, he's got to drive a Cadillac while people are in Corollas. We're going to ask the question, well, should pastors get paid or should they not? Because the people of Corinthians was asking the same question. Is church really essential? And then the, the first video, notice I went from the back to the front. The first video, now we've had to live stream for over two months. 
and we've been live streaming, and some of y'all got Cheerios right now that you eating on, and you say, preach, pastor. Go ahead and preach. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you are disengaged while connecting through this live video, that ain't church. Church is sacrifice. Churches get rid of all of the distractions. Let me focus on God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Hey, turn off that, turn off the switch, turn off the Xbox, turn off the music. Pastor is proclaiming what thus says the Lord. And I got to focus all of my attention there. There's some people right now jogging with me in their ears saying, I'm in church right now. No, you're not. You just listen to me say a few words. I hope you get something. So don't disconnect. Don't get convicted. Don't disconnect. <laughs> Because God's got something for you. But I'm going to tell you, it's gotten to a place where we're asking the question, is church even essential? I'm going to tell you, oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. I need you. You need me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm going to challenge all of us because I know God is changing things through this pandemic. And the reason why you got some pastors saying, we got to get back together, you know why? Because they bottom line is starting to hurt. <laughs> and they say, we, we, we going to meet no matter what. Connect ain't in that position. We fine. We are perfectly okay if you say, hey, I'm going to wait some time and I'm going to live stream. That's cool. We're going to start on May 31st and some are going to be at home and that is perfectly okay. Our bottom line isn't hurting. As a matter of fact, our offering has gone up since the pandemic. But I know some that's got these massive buildings, they just like, we got to get them back in here quick. <laughs> that ain't us. Is church essential? Should a pastor get paid? Do I need to go to church? Or can I just check in on a can? But you got to make sure you're intentional about connecting with the Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to us. I know, God, that you want to challenge us for such a time as this. Open our ears, open our hearts. Please open up this word for us today. In Jesus' everlasting name, amen, amen, amen. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. A couple weeks ago, Pastor John did an excellent job talking to us about food sacrifice to idols. And there were some mature and some new Corinthians, new believing Corinthians, that basically said, hey, um, you shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols, Okay. And, and some of the more mature Corinthians was just like, hey, an idol is nothing anyway. So why do we have to worry about food sacrificed to idols? Just eat it. It's, it's meat. But then Paul said, look, if it's causing your brother to stumble, then don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Why? Because it's about the kingdom. It's about getting people closer to the Lord. It's about helping people find Jesus. So if somebody's hung up on something, it's okay. Fine, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. I tell you, too often we get hung up on things like our politics, things like different belief systems, different things in the scriptures. And you know what unbelievers say? They say, man, if that's what Jesus is about, I'll, I'll never come to church. I remember listening to uh, um, MSNBC one day, and, he, and she was just like, Man, if Jesus is supposed to be so good, why are Christians so mean? <laughs> I, that tripped me out, y'all. And I'm going to tell you, um, our junk is a stumbling block to some people. Is that really that important? Well, now Paul gets to the place where he says, let's talk about money now. Let's talk about the bishop. Let's talk about the pastor. Let's talk about the apostle. Some of y'all are hung up on his title and his position, and you say, you know what? If that's what it is, I ain't never coming to church. Because, you, you know, when I see a pastor in his fine suits drinking oblets, I say, look, uh-uh, that, that can't be of God. And you know what Paul says? He says, put your goblet away and 
put the fine suit away. And even if it means you don't need to get paid right now, Pastor, it's okay. Because you don't want to be a stumbling block to the gospel. That's where this conversation heads. Y'all, it gets really good. Look at what he says in uh, 1 Corinthians first, um, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 13. He says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. And I will not cause my brother to stumble. So he says, look, if this is going to cause my brother to stumble, Okay? But then look at what he says in, verse, in chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to you, to those who examine me, is this. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? You see, they were struggling with this. Is the church essential? Is a pastor essential? Isn't that the same question? Governors are saying, you know, do we need to even open church? I heard one, one pastor, one theologian say, look, if we don't open churches um, soon, the church may never open again. Why? Because there are so many unbelievers that just don't get it. Why do you have to go to church? Why do you have to gather? Why do y'all got to sing? Why do y'all got to smile so much? They just won't get it. Why, why y'all love fairy tales? I mean, that, that, that preacher, I mean, is he really that good? They just don't get it. Why? Because the gospel is foolishness to those who are parents. And they are asking the question, is church even essential? Well, let me start by number one. Number one, pastors are essential. Nine, it says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work? In, in, in the Lord, Paul says, look, look at, look at simply this. You should respect me simply because of my credentials. I'm an apostle. I've seen the Lord. And he says, why am I an apostle? Because I saw the resurrected Christ. That's why I always get leery when folks start calling themselves apostle. Because, because Paul qualified himself and said, I'm an apostle because I saw the resurrected Jesus. So if you're apostle so-and-so, I hope you've seen Jesus. Because that's what he said, what qualifies him. But he said, look, here's the reason. Because I've been with Jesus and I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I meet all of the criteria to be a pastor or to be an apostle or to be a bishop. He says, pastors are essential. You know, a couple years ago, somebody came and said, uh, Pastor Tez, um, we are shooting this reality show on preachers in Atlanta. And they said, man, you got to look. We would love for you to be on it. I know you got a, a growing church. We'd love for you to be on it. So I came to Gayla, and she, she didn't just say no. She said something else. <laughs> but the reason being was, was simply this. Because people disrespect pastors. Think about all of the movies that you see. He's portrayed as a pimp. He's betrayed as a womanizer. He's betrayed as a person that's, that's lusting for money. Every movie you can think of, they never portray a pastor in a highlight. And what does Paul say? He says, look, am I not an apostle? Have I not been with Jesus? Have I not seen the resurrected Lord? In other words, you should check my credentials and you'll see I'm essential. Does that make sense? You know, um, usually about every year I speak at career days at school. And you guys know I'm an IT director, and I'm also a pastor. And as an IT director, I get to lead 20 developers, uh, business analysts, project managers, and, and I lead it for the, the largest uh, in America. And uh, then I tell them I'm a pastor. 
And I said, man, I get to minister to the souls of people. I get to encourage people at their darkest times. God has allowed me to do great work here in South DeKalb. And guess what? I get to help change the world by preaching Jesus. And then I asked them a question. I say, um, so which one do you think requires the most education? They say, oh, being an IT director, you got to, you know, have four years of college, at least a master's degree, and you need to know how to program, you need to know how to do this, do that. You got to have a lot, lot of credentials to do that. I say, nope. <laughs> I'm an IT director, and all I got is certifications and associates under my belt for being an IT director. That's it. But to be a pastor... I got a bachelor's in Bible, a bachelor's in counseling, a double master's in Hebrew and academic ministry. And every day I'm learning and searching and praying and investing in becoming and, 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 and giving what thus says the Lord with the utmost carefulness. Why? Because when I stand and proclaim what thus says the Lord, I'm representing the mouth and voice of God. This isn't anything you skip into. This isn't anything you, you, you limp into. Amen. I want to tell you the care and time that you come in. Paul was like, don't you realize how much time I've invested to be an apostle, a pastor, or bishop? You should respect me by checking my credentials. Wow. That's what he said. Listen to what else he says. He says in verse uh, verse 2, he says, if to others I am an apostle, at least. What is he saying? He's saying, look at the life change that's happened in Corinth because of what God has done through me. You see, these Corinthians, man, you know. They were party hardy. This was the Las Vegas of the day. They were pagans. They worshiped multiple gods. They were driven by their sexual desires. And Paul comes in, and guess what? Corinth changes. The people of Corinth change. And he says, if you need any further evidence, just look at the transformation God did through me in your life. He says, check my credentials. Respect what I'm doing. But then here's where it gets good. I know y'all think, all right, pastor, so should a pastor get a paycheck? Let's see. Verse 3. Um, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have, to, not have the right to refrain from working? <laughs> I'll tell y'all, some people look at pastors and you know what they say? They say, look, he needs to, he needs to be at church seven days a week. And I, I, I'm going to drive by the church. Not just that I want to come in. I just want to make sure his car is there. Amen. And you know what? He better not ask for that much money. He needs to drive a Cadillac. He needs to drive a pickup truck. <laughs> And when he comes, you know what? He doesn't need to be in the finest clothes. We got to make sure we keep him humble. <laughs> Paul says, don't I got the right to eat? Don't I got the right to, to take part? And then not only that, he brings up his wife. In other words, he says, the church actually has an obligation to not only take the pastor, but make sure they take care of who? His wife. Shall I not bring along my wife? I tell you, there are some churches, they say, all right, we're going to look after you, but your wife, she better work. And she better make sure she got, she makes sure she's on point, make sure she ain't shabby when she come in, make sure she, she makes sure she's working in the church. Let's put her in children's ministry. Let's put her here. Let's put her there. She needs to make sure, and then she better go home and work to balance out because we can only pay you part time, Bishop. I mean, hey, am I misreading something here? Is the church essential? Your pastor is essential. Why? Because that's what God's word says. But he makes it even plainer. Look at what he says in uh, verse 7. Anytime serves as a soldier at his own expense. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use milk from his flock? He said, can you imagine a soldier fighting in a war 
day, but then working the night shift. Just got through battling all day, but you know what? I got to pay the bills. I'm going to work at FedEx at night. Y'all respect your military, right? We better. Every time our military shows up, even if they're, at a, if they're stepping off the plane, we try to say we've got to take care of our troops. Isn't it interesting? He goes there and says, take care of your troops. You need to take care of your troops. But then he says a farmer. He says a farmer, when he, when he farms, does he not have the right to take part in his own vineyard? Does he not have the right to reap the harvest that has been sown? And then he says a shepherd, he says a shepherd is watching over his beast. Does he not have the right to even milk his own cows? I'm going to tell you, this is an uncomfortable message for me. Because most of y'all know, I I haven't got a check from Connect Church in six years. Neither do I want a check from Connect Church. And I'll tell you why in a second. But the point of this is simply this. Don't think that a pastor don't deserve to be taken care of. Why? Because he's essential. He's essential for the cause of Christ. He's essential for the ministry of the gospel. He's essential. Then then he he gets real, real. Look at at what he says in verse 9. He he talks about a soldier. He talks about a farmer. He talks about his credentials. He says, look, you can check my credentials. You can, you can check the soldiers. You can check uh, the natural order of things, soldiers, farmers, and shepherds. But then he says, why don't you check the law? Look at what he says with the law, verse 9. For it is written, what is he referring to, the law? It says, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while, he's, while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? What he quotes here is, is, is Deuteronomy uh, 29. He quotes Deuteronomy 25.4, I mean. And when he quotes Deuteronomy 25.4, Deuteronomy 25.4 says, do not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, okay? Um, you got to imagine when an ox is, is, is pulling a plow, the ox is working hard. He's got a big, heavy rock that's next to him. He's plowing the grain. And as he's plowing the grain, what happened is the grain gets refined and it starts pouring out. So you got to imagine this ox is pulling, he's pulling, he's pulling. Can you imagine if you muzzled the ox? He's working, he's working, he's working. But the ox, he even he want to lean over and eat some of the grain that he's now harvested. Why? He wants to benefit from the work that he's doing. In other words, what he's saying is, you don't treat your pastor as good as a dumb ox. Even an ox will will, will plow, and as he sees the grain, will lean over and say, let me take a break. I need to eat some of this grain. Can he take um, 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 benefits in in the spiritual work that he's doing? Don't muzzle the ox. Muslim. You know, um, my dad and I, we, we used to love I used to love going rabbit hunting with him. And we go rabbit hunting and we'd have a pack of beagles. It'd be about six or seven beagles. Now I'm gonna tell you, we really wasn't doing that much. We pretty much just let the dogs out and say, go get him. <laughs> And the dogs would be running. They would go through sticker briars. And sometimes they would get bloody because the sticker briars would cut them on the face. And they'd be running, sniffing out. They would find a rabbit in a hole. The rabbit would jump out and start running. They would run and chase other rabbits. We'd just be sitting there, go get him, Buck. Go get him. And they'd be running everywhere. Sometimes they'd jump into a pond, swim across the pond. They'd run and run. And all of a sudden, they'd run the rabbit back towards us. And guess what? For breakfast, we had rabbit. But when we got home from hunting, you know what we always used to do? Man, you did a good job today. We feed those dogs good. T-bones. To tell you, dad will cook on the stove, and all of a sudden the dogs be like, thank you, thank you, pops, for taking care of us. We took care of you. Thank you for taking care of us. You know what Paul is saying? Why your pastor ain't even as good as your dog? That he can't benefit from the labor that he's doing. Pastors are essential. Bishops are essential. Now I'm going to tell you, Paul not complain about not getting a paycheck. 
You guys know that Paul, he, he, he worked with his hands. He built tents. Tents were very important. Why? Because people were nomadic and they needed tents. They needed sturdy shelter as they were traveling from place to place. You didn't have a car to get in. If you were traveling, you had days worth of travel. And if you had days worth of travel, you needed a sturdy tent. He had a reputable business. Paul preached. He started churches, but he worked with his hands. And I'm going to tell you how I know Paul got tired sometimes. 1 Corinthians 4.12, listen to this. He says, and we and when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. In other words, we're toiling with our own hands, and even when it gets hard, we endure. We keep going. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 11 and 9, Paul is giving this message to the Corinthians, right? By the time he writes 2 Corinthians 11 9, he reminds them of what he said in 1 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 11 9. It says, and when I was present with you the first time and I was in need, I was not a burden to you. I was in need, but I didn't even burden you. Why? For the cause of Christ. For the cause of Christ. I just worked. I was bivocational. I, I, I worked during the day. I ministered to through in, in the night. I, I, I worked my fingers to the bone. Why? Because I wanted to make sure you had no excuses when it came to the cause of Christ. But he brought it up because he says it was hard. It was hard to do. Um, I remember one, one week I took off from my, from my day job and I was talking to Dennis Mitchell. And I was talking to Dennis Mitchell, and I said, yeah, man, this week I'm going to take off. And I said, well, great. And he said, well, are you preaching on Sunday? I said, yeah. I said, are you, uh, um, are you doing Bible study on Wednesday? I said, yeah. He said, you didn't take off. He said, what, what are you talking about? You took off. You're doing double duty. You're doing two jobs. And you're still trying to maintain. And you know when you really take a break, and you need one. You realize Jesus even expected his disciples, his apostles, to participate in the fruit of their labor. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent out his disciples, and you know what he said? He said, don't take, uh, don't take a bag with you, don't take money with you, don't take anything with you. Why? Why did he say that? Because he says, whoever you ministering to should have the decency enough to take care of you. That came from Jesus. Your bishop, your pastor, is important. He is essential. And it's funny, Paul has to go through all of this to prove to the Corinthians you should treat him with some sort of respect. But, now you would think Paul was saying this because, look, y'all are going to have to pay me. I ain't doing this no more. I'm not going to be dealing with y'all raggedy Corinthians. I got to sit up here and I got to call the sick. I got to encourage. I got to evangelize. I got to train you as leaders. And I got a tent build on the side. I'm not doing this anymore. Wouldn't you think this is why Paul was doing it? Uh, on the contrary, my sister, my brother. Look at what he says in verse 12. He says this. If others share right over you, do we not more? In other words, you know, you, you don't expect your lawyers to give you a discount. You don't expect your policemen to give you a discount. You don't expect your, your grocers to give you a discount. If they don't have to give you a discount, why should we? But listen to what he says. Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endured all things so that we would be no hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, look, I should be getting something from y'all, but don't. Why? Because I don't want to hinder anybody from accepting Jesus. This is why I said in the beginning, I'm not preaching this, and I'm going to tell you, I told, I told Solomon on the way here, this is the most uncomfortable message I've ever had to preach. Because I'm not a dude that's big on money. And I never have been. From si for six years, I've said, connect, do not pay me. And I'm still saying, don't. I'm grateful that I'm able to be an IT director and take care of my family. But he says, the reason why I'm doing this so that there are no hindrances to the gospel. Guess what? 
There's some people that listen to me right now that are saying, the reason why I don't go to church is because the bishop make too much money. I've taken away your excuses. There's not a dime that funds my family from Connect Church. Now, what you got to say about that? Will you now accept Jesus? Will you now surrender to the Lord? And see, and see, the reason why is, 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 is God has blessed me and I'm cool. But I say, when money comes in to connect church, I say, let's hire staff. That's why we got a COVID-19 response plan. Because God has allowed us to store up in a savings account. So when people say, I'm struggling with rent this month, I'm struggling because I just got laid off, I'm struggling with food, every request that we've gotten, whether in our church or outside our church, we've been able to do something for them. And that's what God has called us to do. Why? So you ain't got no excuse not to accept Jesus. This pandemic didn't happen to push you away from church. This pandemic happened to push you closer to God, closer to church, closer to the body of Christ. Quit coming up with all of the excuses of why. See, this is why I don't come to church because Bishop drive a Cadillac and everybody else is in a Corolla. So what? This is in a pickup truck. Now, what you got to say about that? Will you now accept Jesus? Will you now surrender your life to the Lord? Paul said, I do this so that there will be no hindrances. In other words, what he's saying is pastors are essential, but gospel ministry is essential. Gospel ministry within the church is essential. It's essential for the cause of Christ. I'm going to tell you here at Connect, we've removed away the excuses. Why have you not surrendered your life to the Lord? Listen to what he says in verse 14. Do you not know that those who perform sacred service eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? In other words, people that are working in the temple, they eat the fruit of the temple. Verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel. To get their living from what? The gospel. It's kind of like Paul is preaching against what he's actually doing. (laughs) He said, it's totally okay for your bishop to get his living from the gospel. But I'm not because I want to take away your excuses. Gospel ministry is essential. He says the gospel is what's foremost, the gospel of Jesus. You know, we've been studying Revelation on Wednesdays, and that's why I've been going so long, because, man, it's hard to go through the Revelation without taking your time through those passages. But the one thing that I hope you guys have seen on that Wednesday study of Revelation is this the end. I hope you've seen the value of the church, the value of gospel ministry in the church. And the reason why I hope you've seen it is because, you know, by the time you get to Revelation 6, it gets ugly. It talks about a third of the world being burned. It talks about the four horsemen. It talks about wars. It talks about um, um, the water system being damaged. It talks about um, um, fire from the sky, boulders falling from the sky. You see an angry God that says, it's now time to judge the world. Let me ask you a question. What's the only thing stopping God from coming back and judging the world right now? the church. The scripture calls the church the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Preserve. If we are not here, if you guys think COVID-19 is bad, can you imagine if the church is taken away? 
Because once the church is taken away, God says, now the remnant that I had is gone. Come on, demon. You're going to inflict everybody with disease. Come on, angel. You're going to cause a, a half of the world to starve. Come on. You're going to cause um, um, wild beasts to come out of the woods and eat people alive. Come on, locust. You're going to come and blow through this world because now it's time for me to deal with this world. And what Paul is saying, you don't realize it, but if it wasn't for the church, y'all would be in trouble. The church is essential. Gospel ministry is essential. And unfortunately, there are going to be politicians that's not going to get it until we And when we go on, they're going to be like, where are the Christians? Can you imagine a world where believers are not praying? Can you imagine a world where believers are not being light in the midst of darkness? Can you imagine a world where we're not here? And what he says is, all hell breaks loose on earth. You may not believe that the church is essential now, but one day you will. And you'll say, boy, I wish the church was still here. I wish the church was still here. Paul says, Gospel ministry is essential. And because gospel ministry in the church is essential, I want my paycheck to be a hang-up for you. I'd rather you surrender your life to Jesus. Is church essential? You best believe it is. And that's why May 31st, we're coming back together. There are going to be some people that won't be here, and that's fine. Because I think you can be a viable member of Connect Church and be mostly online. Okay? God is changing things, y'all. Think about it. There are churches right now that seat 2,000 that haven't been open for three months. Is that a good use of resources? No. God's changing things. And I'm going to tell you here at Connect, I believe we got a pathway for you to be connected to a church. Even if you say, hey, I'm very far from Connect, I'm going to be there sometimes, but a good portion of what I do is going to be online. I feel like there's a way to do it. I'll talk about that in a second. Now, for most of us, we're going to be here. We're going to be here ministering, and we're going to be here fellowshipping. We're going to be here um, um, as a body and a remnant of believers joined together. But for some, you're going to be connected a different way. You're going to be on prayer call three days a week. You're going to have a leader that's over you for small groups, and you're going to be connecting with them on a weekly basis. You're going to take advantage of things like what's next and next level when we do online training. And I love the way we're doing it. When you come together, it's like, man, we, we, we get to sit back and just get into the Word. And people can ask questions, and we can pray for each other. We can encourage each other. I'm going to tell you. That's been the most fun I've had at Connect Church doing Next Level and seeing the life on lifetime that can happen through a Zoom meeting. It's powerful. And I'm going to tell you, for some of y'all, y'all going to say, you know what? I can be just as connected by being predominantly online. But I'm going to tell you, this pandemic didn't happen to push you away from church. It happened to push you, it happened to push you closer to the church. My final challenge to you is simply this. Check your motives. Check your motives. Where are you at? Are you an unbeliever? You don't need it. Why do we really need the church? I hope this message has challenged you to say, I need the church and I need the Jesus that is Lord over the church. Some people are saying, Pastor, I'm hung up on your paycheck. And, some, and I hope this message is said, you know, that pastor is worth his reward. And I hope you won't let that hang you up. Connect, we've taken away that excuse anyway, because this bishop isn't hung up on money. I'm doing it for the cause of Christ so that you will get to know Jesus. And some people are distracted and they said, you know what? Yeah, while I'm jogging, I'll put church in and I'm going to go to church. That ain't church. You've got to have dedicated time where you're focused and sacrificing time to the Lord. You've got to have time where you're connecting with other believers, time where you're praying with other believers, and we're offering all of that at Connect Church. Get connected to 
to Jesus. God is challenging us to check our motives. Look at what he says in 15. It'll be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than to have man make boast of an empty one. You know what Paul said? He said, you know what? If me getting paid is going to cause you to um, not accept Jesus and surrender your life to the Lord, I'd rather starve to death. That's what he said. I'd rather starve. You see, Paul understood something. That my name wasn't always Paul. It used to be Saul. And I'm going to tell you, I don't deserve to be standing here right now preaching to you. But for some reason, God loved me so much to arrest me on the Damascus Road. And I met Jesus, and he saved my life. He forgave me. Woe is me if I don't tell you about Jesus and the forgiveness that you can have if you surrender your life to him. And I'm going to tell you, like Paul, I got a story. I don't deserve to be sitting here preaching to you right now. I don't deserve to be the pastor or bishop of Connect Church. This person that grew up addicted to different things, this person that grew up apart from God, fighting against God, not wanting to be in relationship, for some reason God said, I love you, Tez, and I died for you, and I'm going to clean you up and make you whole again. You know what I say? Because of what God did for me, I don't want anything to stop you from surrendering your life to the Lord. If that means I got to preach for free, I'm going to preach for free. <laughs> so that you'll surrender your life to him. Check your motives. Check your motives. You know, every time pandemics happen, every time major crises happen, God does a change and a shift. When September 11th, after that, we said we are too dependent on the Middle East when it comes to oil. So we said, you know what? We're going to start raising up cornfields. We're going to look at alternative solutions and other sources. We're going to dig in the ocean. We're going to look for other sources so that we're no longer dependent on the Middle East. And you realize right now, we do not depend on the Middle East for oil. That shift, that change happened after September 11th. Remember the mortgage crisis. When the mortgage crisis happened, there were, there were shifts and changes that happened, okay? Airbnb came out of the mortgage crisis. People decided, you know what? Um, I can rent my house when I'm on vacation for a week, and that rental of my house will actually pay for my vacation. So when people go on vacation, they register an Airbnb and will rent their house for a, year, for, for a week while they're on vacation. Y'all, that was birthed out of the mortgage crisis to where now even how we shop for hotels has changed. You know what else changed after the mortgage crisis? Uber and Lyft. You realize cabs are almost obsolete because people came up with the idea of, you know what, we can take advantage of GPS and right where you are, everybody in the world could be a taxi cab driver. The world changed. Why? Because God decided to do something to make a shift. And I'm going to tell you, this shift right now is affecting the church. God is saying you can't be busy as usual as a church. He didn't send this pandemic to push you away from the church. He got rid of all of your distractions so that you can come back committed to the church. Some people right now would be getting junior ready for AAU. Guess what? AAU basketball is closed. Only thing you can do is check in and listen to a message. Some people would be taking their kids to cheer camp right now or dance academy. Let me tell you something. We have become the busiest society on Sunday, but everything closed now. Why? Because God is saying, I'm taking away all of the distractions to push you back to focus on me. I'm taking away all of the distractions so now you can say, I got to get back to church, y'all. I got to get back to worship. I got to get back to Jesus. 
Some people have been watching more live services than they've ever watched before and haven't been in church for years. But for some reason, God decided to make this shift to say, I'm going to take your job away. I'm going to take your distractions away. The restaurant you love, the bar you love, everything that you normally do to where the only thing you can do is dial up social media and listen to this bald-headed preacher. God did it so that he could push you back to God, not so you can mail it in. Some folks, I do believe you can be an online member of Connect Church. An online membership looks like five things. Number one, we teach on Sundays and Wednesdays. So Sunday and Wednesday, be engaged. You wake your kids up, you get ready on Sunday and Wednesday, and you dial in to Facebook Live or YouTube Live, put away the distractions, turn off all your phone, and say, I'm going to focus on Jesus Sundays and Wednesdays. That's number one. Number two, all the Zoom classes of learning that we have. We've been doing Next Level. I got another one starting June 26th. I got another one starting June 1st. You may need to say, you know what, I got to go to a Zoom class. And what's cool about that, we talk, we interact, everybody's camera's on, and we disciple and love each other. Number three, three times a week we pray. 6.30 in the morning we pray. You can be a viable member of leading. It could be Minister Felicia, could be Miss Angela, could be me or Pastor John. Dyke comes on, Pastor Dyke, and, he t- and we say, who's on the line? And people that And all of a sudden, the connectedness, the love that's happening on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is just powerful, y'all. If you do that three times a week and you connect with folks, what you're going to say is, is, man, I love my sister. I love my brother. I'm so glad we connect regularly in prayer. You do that, man, it'll be powerful for you. So number one, Sunday and Wednesday, live teaching. Number two, Zoom classes. You register for those online. Number three, connect three times a week in prayer. Number four, if you become an online member, I'm going to assign a person to watch over you. Y'all realize in the pandemic, every member has a person that's watched over them. You've probably gotten a phone call of people saying, I'm just calling to check in on you. That was I'm going to be mostly an online member. Somebody will be there to watch over you, and they will be a part of their small group to connect with. And sometimes they're going to say, hey, we're meeting together. And lastly, number five, church is about using gifts to pour into others. So it can't just be about, okay, I'm going to get on live and I'm going to listen to Pastor Tez. No. How are you using the gifts that God has given you to pour into others? Well, I'm going to tell you, Connect Church never lacks service opportunities. Do y'all realize we've still been feeding Safe House every month since we've been out of up for the pandemic? We've gone and fed. All you would have to do is sometimes cook, sometimes make a phone call to some senior that's in need, take a senior grocery shopping. There are plenty of opportunities for you to pour into others. If you do those five things, you know what I'm going to say? Don't come to church. If you connect every Sunday and Wednesday, you're a part of Zoom classes like What's Next and Next Level. If you are in prayer three times a week at 6.30 in the morning, a group leader is assigned over you and you're checking in with them. And number five, you're using your gifts to pour into others. I'm going to say you are doing such effective ministry. You are the church. And I give you an excuse because you are so connected in being the church you may not need to come to the building. I know there are some pastors freaking out right now saying, this pastor said they ain't got to come to the building. That's exactly what I said. Why? Because God used this pandemic so that we would stop coming to church and start being the church. Now, I'm going to tell you, May 31st is going to be powerful. I pray that this house is full of folks all of us masked up, and we're worshiping the Lord. But I pray with the 200 people that will be here on May 31st, I pray there's a couple hundred on social media also saying, wow, 
we're all together, and we are the church. My challenge to you is simply this. Don't go back to business as usual. Don't go back to business as usual. This pandemic was purposed to cause a shift in you and a shift in God's church. I'm out of time, and there's a lot to discuss here. The last thing I'll read is this. Um, he said, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews. So to those who are under the law, I became under the law. Though not being myself under the law, but so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, without the law, though they being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I may win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win those who are weak. Why? I've learned to become all things to all people to minister and reach some for the cause of Christ. I know there are some churches that say, I got to get this building open. Otherwise, we are going to go bankrupt. Is that really what God wants you to do? He may be saying, you need to shift and change things. This is the new Uber that's coming. The new Airbnb that's coming. To where you can revolutionize your ministry and actually be about reaching people for Jesus. For the millennial, become a millennial. For the boomer, become a boomer. For Generation X, the forgotten generation, that's me, become a Generation X. Become all things to all people to reach some for the cause of Christ. He says, don't let anything hinder folks from finding Jesus. If you got to shift your ministry, do it. We end off with three things. Y'all know, um, before Connect was in the pandemic, we were searching, searching, searching for a building. And God closed many doors. was like, nope, not that one, not that one, not that one. And then all of a sudden, for almost three months, church didn't even, even meet. And we was like, praise God, we didn't jump into no building. Well, I'm going to tell you, the new Connect church that will be built will not be the typical church. Because think about it. There are churches that got 1,000-seat sanctuaries that were sitting for three months. What does that mean? They weren't very useful. And let's think about it. Even when those churches were in, they were only open for once a week. Otherwise, it just sat to be a sanctuary for people to sit in. The Connect Church that we build is going to be multi-purpose. It's going to be Connect Sports. It's going to be a place where you can come and get your workout in the gym. You can go through your Zumba classes and your aerobic classes with Melinda. Y'all know Melinda used to be an aerobics instructor. You can have your basketball seasons, and every Sunday we're going to join together. Our church is going to be open seven days, well, six days. The seventh day is always going to be church. We'll have our clothing closet. We'll have our food pantry. We'll have our job training. We'll be there for people in our community. Why? Because I believe God is shifting the church. It can't be just a sanctuary that we sit in once a week. And that's why as a church, we got to check our motives. Are we getting people to come back because we think, hey, my bottom line is hurting right now. Uh, uh, There's more offering. People are sitting in these chairs. And we need to be thinking, how can I be more effective for the kingdom with the resource God has given me? is shifting. Everybody say, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. takes. What Paul is saying, I'll do whatever it takes for the cause of Christ. Whatever it takes. If I gotta gotta, gotta not take a paycheck, fine. Whatever it takes. If I gotta change the whole building and layout of the church, whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. Whatever it takes. Fidel Castro, who led Cuba for many years. One day he came up with the law and said, if your church is over 20, your church is illegal. It got to the place where in Cuba, they could not have a church over 20 people. 
like that right now. Okay? People thought this was going to kill the church. <laughs> you know what happened? It started a church Because when the church got up to about 18, they started pointing out leaders and saying, Johnny, you've been with us for a while. We now got to raise you up, and you're going to start a church over on that side. Take three or four people with you and start a church over on that side. And what happened is churches began popping up everywhere in Cuba. The very thing that they thought was going to kill the church actually caused Cuba to catch on fire. Because all of a sudden, everybody started raising up and saying, we going to be the church. What if God used the pandemic to help this church to catch on fire? I know there's some people like that. That joker done gone crazy. <laughs> no, I haven't. I've gone biblical. <laughs> I've become all things to all people. Do whatever it takes to reach people for the gospel. Final story. Pastor Johnny Hunt pastors this huge church, First Baptist Church of Woodstock. When he was interviewing for that church, the deacons were interviewing, and they were asking him questions about theology. They were asking him questions about different things. And he said, you know what? Let's stop the interview. He said, I'm willing to pastor a church that's willing to do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. If that means we sell a building, we sell a building. If that means we fire some folks, then I'm sorry, we got to let some folks go. If that means we change the way we do things, we do a strong online presence, a strong offline presence. I'm looking for a church to not get hung up on what color the walls are, how much the bishop getting paid, and how much is this happening. I'm looking for a church that's saying, what does it take to reach people for Jesus? And if you're not the church that's willing to do whatever it takes to reach people for Christ, I'm not the pastor for you. And I'm going to tell you, if you've ever met Pastor Johnny, that joker did some ministry and started reaching thousands of people for Jesus all on the premise of we'll do whatever it takes to reach people for Christ. How is God challenging you today? Is he challenging you to put away your hangups and get serious about your relationship with the Lord? Is he challenging you to take your faith to another level? Is he challenging this church to shift and do something different and not be business as usual? How is God challenging you is he using this pandemic to say, it's time for you to stop running from the church and it's time for you to get more connected to the church because it's essential for your life. Your pastor is essential for your life. And I'm going to tell you, things won't get right until you get the area, this area of your life right with the Lord. I'm going to tell you, if you're on this, if you're listening to this live right now, my challenge to you is surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Become a part of a church. Get rid of the excuses. This pandemic was to push you closer to the Lord, not further away from the Lord. If you're on a live right now, I challenge you, go to our website. There's a button there that says, I'm new here. I challenge you right now. I'm new here and register and say, hey, I want to be a part of Connect Church. Maybe God is challenging you and saying you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Do that right now where you are, but let us know about it because we want to challenge you and encourage you and train you how to walk with God. Don't let this pandemic happen for nothing. Let this thing transform your life. If you're a pastor trying to figure out 
What are we going to do in this pandemic? Let me tell you something. God does not want business as usual. Don't just come back into the church and be the same thing you were before three months ago. Come back and let God start revival in your community and in your church. Because you've made the decision, I'm do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Have you put your trust in Jesus? Have you put your trust in Jesus? My challenge to you, put your trust in him. Don't wait another moment. Don't wait another second. Put your trust in Jesus. It's so sweet to put your trust in him. It's not time to waver. It's not time to, 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 to put off what God is challenging you to do today. Surrender to him.